welcome to the Thorn Desk. I am Lisa Daftari. And today we have with us a friend of the Thorn Desk, someone I've been wanting to have on the show for a very long time now. I'm joined by radio host and political commentator David Webb, currently the host of the David Webb Show on Sirius XM Patriot Channel 125 and also a Fox News contributor. Welcome to the show, David. Well, it's great to be here. And as a fan of the foreign desk and friends for a long time, I love this. I have yeah. to say that right up front. Being anywhere with you, having a conversation is a great thing. Well, this is a very long time coming because um, as, if for those of you who, who know David, and I know all of you do because he's everywhere, uh, he is a man of, of, of many talents. So he's able to ask the questions. And I was on his radio show this morning and he asks wonderful questions. But he's also a very astute, sharp, brilliant commentator who has his finger on the pulse of America, our foreign policy, our national security. And that's exactly what I want to do a deep dive into today. Uh, David, I ha usually have all of my guests start off by doing um, their assessment of Biden's national security foreign policy. What letter grade would you give the Biden administration so far on the job that they've done um, and why? I'd give them... Um at best a D, but really an F. And the F is based on the grading curve of failure. They fail to adjust course. They fail to do what many administrations, whether Republican or Democrat, have had to do when they want to address issues. They adjust course when it doesn't work or when world events change. And asymmetrically right now with the relationship with China, with Russia, with the Middle East, tie in the economy, tie in the other parts of the globe. When you start putting this together, you see that they won't adjust course. They stay locked into a singular belief system. And it starts with America not stepping into a leadership or at least in a advisory capacity with both our friends around the world and our enemies. So we need to be in that position. They won't adjust course. And that's why I go to an F. It's a fail to see things as they are. Foreign policy, and as you and I know from many who've been involved in this for many years, those of us who report on it like you do, that foreign policy doctrine and diplomacy are about choices. They're about making adjustments. The Biden administration fails. And then in some cases, and tragically so, they lie to the American people. And I can give you specific examples. Some I'm involved in since the fall of Afghanistan and the horrific withdrawal. But there are literally cases I can now cite factually and from a personal experience where they, they lie to the American people. And the world is watching. The world is not unaware of the lies. Do you think, I mean, sure, I think a lot of people have have had issue with and, and, and criticized the Biden administration, but for different reasons. Now, just broadly speaking, do you think it's an issue of incompetency or more is this by design? I think there's a bit of both. I, the ideology that drives them uh, <laughs> is carried along by a level of incompetency. So there's this belief system, for instance, putting John Kerry ahead of the climate change argument as they presented, putting Anthony Blinken at the State Department, bringing in Jake Sullivan, a longtime Biden conspirator. I frankly, that's what you have to call him as we learn more about Ukraine and other actions in the national security apparatus. Look at the people they've surrounded themselves with. So you have the ideology and you have the incompetence. Their failure to adjust course, I believe, is in part because they're unable to seek advice. And look, Lisa, when you when you need input from experts, it's not necessarily about who you like or who agrees with you, but who understands the world you're dealing in and the specific issue. And rather than have a team of rivals and frankly, most American presidents, most world leaders do better when they have a team of rivals approach, people who have different points of view, but experience in that sector. 
whatever that sector happens to be. That was one of the successes of the Trump administration. There were people I knew in that administration that were not staunch conservatives, people like Gary Cohn, who came from Goldman Sachs, others that I have known and interacted with over years, but yet they were brought in to provide a perspective to provide expertise, and therefore that advice would go to the president's office and decisions could be made that would better address the issue. Right, so you had people who were the best suited for the job, but not necessarily shared the same political views. Now, when you say I ideology, I mean, you know, for the average American, I know you and I are, are, are really up to our necks on this every single day, but for the average American, I think it's very hard to make this this argument that we have elected officials that are in office that don't want to keep our nation safe or aren't going to do what's best for our nation. What is this specific ideology that you speak of, first of all? And secondly, I mean, how, do they truly believe that what they're doing is best for the United States? Sadly, I think a few of them do believe that this is the best vision forward. but. Ideology in this case, Lisa, has a couple of key components. Their ideology is typically belief, right? I believe this to be so. But there's a component here that I think the American people are missing in the conversation, and it is the amoral desire for power at any expense, which is something that Joe Biden has been an example of throughout the majority of his career in the public sector. I wouldn't call it public service. Since he's been in the Senate, this is a man who has looked for what benefits him. So amoral elitism is something that is very dangerous because if you have an ideology of a belief in American sovereignty, or maybe not an ideology, but you have a belief in the sovereignty of the nation, the best mm -hmm. interests of the nation. You sometimes make decisions that people won't like, but are for that reason based on the best available advice and information. And that leads back to correcting course when it goes wrong. But we have amoral elitists who are power hungry, who have been used to abusing the system and having it work out for them, who have filled the various uh, elements of NSC, the National Security Council, uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the military. You look at the wokeism in the military. You look at the departments and the bureaucracies being weaponized. I mean, if I were to say to people right now, and I will, that the FTC was actually weaponized against Twitter, people don't even think of the Federal Trade Commission. But yet here we have that, the Department of Education, the EPA, they're using whatever is available. So it's that combination that's dangerous and it shouldn't be limited to just Democrat versus Republican because the bigger picture is they believe, some of them, that this is how you move America forward. And then there are others and we have to be frankly honest about it. There are many influences on those in government that are elected to office or in bureaucratic circles and in bureaucratic control that hold a far left anti-American view of who we are as a country and what our role should be in the world. And one of the things that supports this is something I have access to that many do not in the media world. I serve on a board, for example, at Florida International University. I have met with over a dozen Latin American presidents and former presidents in the last, I would say, six to eight months. We have sat, we have talked. I had a meeting just the other day with former president of Dominican Republic, a former president of Colombia, Paraguay. I, I sit with them, Honduras, and they tell me their view, having been there for part of the last two years and now out of office or seeking to go back into office as, say, President Hernandez is, as one of the candidates in the Dominican Republic, which is in the Caribbean, but the same thing in Latin America. And they are giving me the world view looking back at America. And we in America need to realize that others see this and have to deal with it either by absence of American leadership or presence of Chinese leadership. Think about that. Right. And um, I'm glad you segued into China. I mean, so many threats going on right now. You can look at the threat coming from China, from North Korea, from Iran's regime, from Venezuela, 
the list goes on and on. Russia obviously trying to stick it to us as well. I mean, our enemies understand that this is a time, this is a you know time to play out the clock, a free for all um, while Biden is in office. But then you have President Biden coming out at, at a fundraiser very recently and saying, climate change is a bigger threat to humanity than nuclear war. He actually said this. This was during a Democratic National Committee at a DNC fundraiser in New York City. And he said, quote, if we don't stay under 1.5 degrees Celsius, we're going to have a real problem. It's the single most existential threat to humanity we've ever faced, including nuclear weapons. And so we have a real big problem. He also said that he inherited an America first foreign policy, which put America last. Look, Biden's a skilled political liar. There is no other way to say this. Since he has been in office, he plays to whatever, in whatever form, gets him to where he wants to be. He's wanted to be president of the United States since the first time he ran. He was out of the race uh, at that point for plagiarism. He has lied so many times about who he is, and he, and he morphs into whatever he needs to be in whatever room. That's why he's a skilled political liar. Now, in this case, using climate change as the example, he's playing to the money and the deep base of the leftist movement in America and to the globalists who will support through their efforts the attempt to shape America and move it. But ask yourself a question, which I don't have the answer to, but I want people to ask this question. Is Joe Biden more interested in Joe Biden, Joe Biden's legacy, Joe Biden's portrait someday hanging in the White House as to other presidents and throughout our history? Or is he interested in America's best interest? Is he also interested in Democrat Party interests? or Joe Biden's interests. Once you start to put those thought processes in place and analyze who he is as a senator, who he, or was as a senator, was as a vice president, and then is as a president, you begin to see someone that has surrounded himself, not only with his family that we now know have factually enriched themselves, have not just worked with China, uh, with Ukraine, with Burisma and others, uh, but it literally has been bleeding the, the elements uh, into themselves from around the world that enrich the family. It, this is actually a, an example of a very powerful elitist elected cartel operating under one man. I mean, the polls indicate that American, the American public is on to him. You know, it, it's it, it's not that that they've continued. I mean, look, whether he got the most votes of any uh, elected official, whether, you know, we don't know what to believe anymore, but he was elected into office. Uh, but the polls indicate that people aren't happy with him. Now, are people beginning to see through comments like these? Or is it just that the American people are in a bad place post pandemic? They're you know, they're looking at their kids schools. They're looking at the homelessness. They're looking at crime. I mean, What's I mean, you have this this perspective, you have a daily show, you, you're 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 interviewing people from all walks of life. What gives I mean, what's going on right now? What's inside the psyche of the American public? And and with that, let's bring us all the way to uh, presidential election 2024. How is it going to affect us? Boy, is there a lot in that. And by the way, why I still like talking to you so much, because we can really get into these things. Look, and, and let me say this. We, we will discuss this. We are going in depth. The people watching need to take the nuggets and work to expand the knowledge base. That's the task I give my listeners every day. Go further. I have only a limited time, but people live our lives 24 hours a day, except for when we're asleep and who knows, maybe then talk show hosts are running things through our brain. But when you look at where this administration and this president and this effort is and whether people see it or not, there's an element of buyer's remorse. We see that from many. Uh, polls are what they are, but they're really snapshots in time. Look at the economy. Look at the effects on the average American. Separate the party registration from this and then go back to the Ronald Reagan question. Are you better off today right. than you were four years ago? Or in this case, it's really two years ago. And then the second part of that question, which people really don't pay attention to as much, is Reagan talked about what does your future 
look like under this president. And that is that buyer's remorse from a policy perspective, from a very kitchen table perspective for the majority of Americans who don't wake up every day and do what you and I do, look into the key issues, make sure things are, you know, explained properly. But they you see it every weekend when they sit down, they see it in their economy. So those people are reacting. Now, there's a warning in this because Democrats have been very smart. When Hillary Clinton lost in 2016, Mark Elias, who was the Hillary Clinton attorney, then at the firm Perkins Coie, started on an effective strategy of changing our election system. And immediately I can hear some people going, well, let's talk about voter fraud and let's talk about no, let's talk about something even more onerous and more dangerous and very real. There has always been voter fraud. We have examples of that long before Donald Trump ran. It's a history of, of, the, of the country. But now when you pervert the system to separate what the Constitution prescribes, which is that the lower house of each state, the legislature, is the one who determines manner and time. And you use COVID to push decisions that were unconstitutional. Secretaries of elections don't make those decisions. Governors don't make those decisions. But by doing so and then incorporating mail-in ballot and other elements which make it easier to get more people to cast a ballot, especially younger people, what they did was they perverted the system to make it easier to overwhelm it. And with that comes a caveat to the Republican voters or the Republican Party more so and to all voters. To a candidate who wants to win, you have to win on the battlefield where you are. You cannot just complain about the system, but in order to fix the system, we need to elect people who want to go back to the Constitution and the structures that are laid out, that the lower houses control the manner and time of election, that we need to have safe and secure, easy to vote, hard to cheat. And if we don't focus on winning those battles, you know, mail-in voting, it's in California, for example, but right. Mike Garcia, a Republican candidate, effectively used it to win his congressional district. In other districts, especially at the state level, you can do this. You have to stop complaining about the problem and going through the path as it exists to go back and bring it to where it works for all so all Americans can do what they need to do and let's cast their vote. So it's important for people to not just get involved in the, the argument or engage in the, the headlines and maybe the first paragraph of the story, but dig into the rest of it, the rest of the story and the process so that we can execute good election systems. And yes, there will always be fraud, sadly. There will always be illegal activities. But what the Democrats did from Mark Elias forward and to realize that he's not done. He and the other eight or 10 members of Perkins Coie left to form a, a second uh, firm, an operation that is quietly working in the states at the legislative level. They're changing the system very much in the way George and Alexander Soros, his son, began the process in 2015 to change the justice system to get DAs, prosecutors and judges elected into the Article Three courts so they can make the decisions to accept cases, to adjudicate, to bring charges. So when you see what's going on, realize that it's the system thereafter while we're arguing about the figures involved. No, when you speak of separation from party, I, I, I think that's such an important point because we do see Americans finally on the same page in a lot of in a lot of places. I know I'm here in Los Angeles. Everyone complains about the homelessness and the crime, but yet we weren't able to remove the DA. Uh, you, you, we weren't able to, you know, get rid of uh, Gavin Newsom as governor. Um, why is it, what, what's the disconnect when people are so upset? And as you said, you know, why aren't they able when they go to the polls, when they go to vote, why aren't they able to vote for the other party? I mean, there is such a taboo. Well, will the Republican party, and I'm not saying the Republicans always the, the, the superior candidate, but when you're upset with the status quo, why would you keep voting for the status quo? Lest you ever get caught voting for the Republican candidate or for the party of Trump or whatever they're, they're calling you now. Well, there's, I want to call it more of a mechanical process here. And I have 
followed elections and covered elections and election structures for decades. And what the Democrats have done to consolidate power is an urban strategy that was the initial name for it, but it's really a voting strategy. Back in the 90s, I was involved in Rock the Vote. I was one of those people that went out there, and no surprise, with people on the left, the right, with other well-known figures, a Carl Lewis, uh, a Jammu Green, to use someone of them. We were on the same stage together. We were on that stage talking about voting and how it's important for people to get involved. But along the way, the Democrats consolidated the blocks of voting and enough voting in areas to be able to control the state from its major urban areas. Then they began to expand to suburban and now exurban areas. So they were conducting a mechanical adjustment and a process adjustment in the system by gathering enough voters to have that percentage. Elections can be won or lost by 50 to 300 votes at the state level, thousands sometimes at the state level. And even at the congressional level, there are races that are decided by a flip of a coin. So they look at the strategy and they look at consolidating delegations within states and then they work into other states. They follow migration, how people move, for what reason. So they have been very successful in being more granular about having the voters in place, which brings us back to, say, a Gavin Newsom or Gascon in L.A. Why can't he be removed or either one of them be removed? It's not that the effort wasn't strong. And yes, it, the real opposition wasn't there, right? There wasn't a counter, like, who's the replacement? Who's the strong uh, other option? But what they did was when they have this base, they they activate it, they come out, they only need to win. They don't need a supermajority, they don't need a thousand votes, they need just one more vote than the other party. And you get my point with that, based on the rules of the, the election system, that's what they're working on. Smart strategy is to spend the long term, not election cycle, thinking, which is unfortunately what political parties do two years, in four years, in six years, whatever that cycle happens to be at whatever level. And that is ineffective strategy when you've got the left thinking more in terms of the next 10 years, the next generation. Their strategy is generational, while unfortunately on the right, Many in the Republican Party, my party, I'm a registered Republican since Reagan, and I, I will always be that since I was 18 years old. But I watched my party fail to build a long term strategy to move the voters to where they they prefer from a policy policy perspective to be for their own sake. And those voters just aren't being engaged. They aren't being activated. But the Democrats, they're activated. And especially with the young, they're being very successful. You know, I, we're almost out of time, which is crazy because I have so much more I want to get to. So we'll definitely have to have you back on. I want to talk about wokeism in the military. I want to talk about the Pentagon leaks. I want to talk about uh, our strategy in terms of national security. But I will end on this very, very important question. It's certainly not climate change, not to you and not to me, the, the number one threat that we are facing as a nation. So what would you say it is? The number one threat is to assess both China, Russia, the Middle East and other events. Think about this. China is using Russia as its pawn, in a sense, to be the actor on the world stage that draws uh, the rest of the, the European nations and others into the Ukraine conflict to create a war-weary Western world, one that also now begins to bind to the inevitability of China. China, inevitably, if China has its way, will have Taiwan. Fighting a war is not the necessary strategy for them. It's to not have a war, but take it. And if you think about what's happening, as we're speaking right now, about 50 nations are gathering in Europe. They will meet on Friday and they will meet, including our defense, Lloyd, Lloyd Austin, our defense apparatus to discuss Ukraine while China acts in its own interest 
around the world in Latin America, while they're acting in the Solomon Islands, while they're building to expand their reach and their influence. So when you look at the threat, see the threat for what it is and who is being used even by China to draw the attention, the resources, the, the conditioning of a war, a war weary world by using conflict. China in this sense is literally using Sun Tzu. For those of you who, who study Sun Tzu and if not, read it. Read the art of leadership, the war not fought. China's view, and this came out in October of 2022, when they had the vote on Xi Jinping and the PRC, uh, the People's Congress rather, not the PRC, but the People's Congress voted. They wrote an amendment into their second, into their constitution and went into the second centenary from Mao's revolution, the first centenary to the second centenary. And their hegemonic view includes using others, including the Middle East, because they are now replacing the Abraham Accords with the Chinese Accords. Mm -hmm. They are playing whatever pieces they need, moving the board around. And while we're just watching the bouncing ball politically, they're watching all the balls in the air. Right. Absolutely. Brilliantly said. No one unpacks it like you do, David Webb. If you'd like to see him Ask the brilliant questions. You can catch him every morning, 9 a.m. to 12 on Sirius uh, XM Patriot Channel 125. And if you'd like to see him commenting and answering with the brilliant questions, you can catch him on Fox News. He's a Fox News contributor and appears on uh, other multiple, I should say, panels and uh, briefings. And he does a lot of wonderful work. Catch him on social media at The David Webb Show. Thank you so much, David, for joining us. For the rest of you who would like to subscribe to our weekly podcast, go to youtube.com slash Lisa Def Terry to sign up for our daily top 10 email. Go to our website, foreigndesknews.com, and we will see you all next week. Thank you, Lisa.